I'm Emil Bjornsson and I will talk about emerging antenna technology and my take on this is what do we need in practice? That is the question that I will try to answer. And I will start with a few observations. So the first one is that we often talk about that the traffic in wireless networks is increasing very rapidly. And if you see the data of this, we can see that over different years, the annual growth is between zero and up to maybe 170%. And 10 years ago, when mobile broadband was a new thing, then we could actually see an enormous increase above 100%. But then over time, this has started to decrease. And now we are down more at like 30%. That is our traffic growth. And this is a similar trend now as we are having on the internet in general. So I think the way to interpret this is that when mobile broadband was new, we were moving over our usage to using mobile devices. And now when we are using mobile devices as the natural type of device, well, then we will see the same kind of traffic growth as for the rest of the internet for the foreseeable future. So what does this really mean? Well, I think that the reason that we're seeing this slow 30% growth is because we are using our devices more and more and not because we really need high data rate per device. Of course, that will also increase over time, but the dominant factor is the total growth of the data traffic that is made up by many different devices. The second observation that I think is important is that most of the active users in a network are at the edge of the cell. So let me explain why that is the case. So here I'm showing a coverage area 500 by 500 meters. I have a base station in the center. It is a simple scenario where you only see a path loss that is degrading the signal strength with the distance. In the center of the cell, you have the base station. And here there is a maximum spectral efficiency in bit per second per hertz that you can deliver because of the modulation format that your standard is supporting. And your hardware cannot deal with higher modulation formats than that number. For example, it might be eight bits per second hertz. Then, as you move further away, the path loss is hurting your signal quality and you cannot use the largest modulation encoding scheme. And after a while, you drop down to small numbers. And here, you are either limited by the noise if you're in large cells, or if you have a small cell deployment, you might be limited by interference. And you're down at rather small spectral efficiency values. So when you turn on your device, you will be somewhere in this network. And since people want to use the same services everywhere, if you are in the center of the cell, you can easily get the service that you need. And your device doesn't need to be continually turned on. Even if you're streaming a video continuously, you can take small breaks all the time uh, when you are not needing data because you, you get the high data rate than you actually need. And people at the edge of the cell, they will need their devices to be turned on all the time. And maybe that isn't enough to give them the data rate of the need. So because of this reason, there are more users active in the cell at the edges because they need to be turned on for a longer time. There is also more area at the edge of the cell, which is contributing even more to this point. So the problem in today's network is not that it is not fast enough in the best cases, it's because a lot of users are in the worst cases where you don't have high enough data rate, not high enough spectral efficiency. I will now give you an example of what impact this has on cellular networks. I will compare two different cases. One that I call massive MIMO, multiple input, multiple output. So you have base stations here with 100 antennas in the center of the cell. There are four cells just to make it easy. And then we have a similar scenario with also four by 100, so 400 antennas, but now they are spread out in 400 cells and just one antenna in each of the base stations. So this is a really small cell or ultra dense network deployment. And if we are looking at the spectral efficiency that you will get and see when you're moving around this area, here's a cumulative distribution function. So it's a variation as you're moving around an area. And what we can see is that for the black curve, which is a cellular massive MIMO network here, we get this black curve. Sometimes it is low, sometimes it is high. And this is describing this hilly behavior that I was showing before as well. Here we are in the center of a cell, here are the edges of cells. If we are switching to this small cell deployment, you get the red curve, which is matching almost entirely. That doesn't mean that at the particular location, both of these networks will deliver exactly the same performance. It just means that on the average, as you move around, you will see the same performance behaviors. 
It's just that the cell edges and the cell centers are moved around to different places. So on the average, you will not be more happy with any of these two deployments. It's dominated by large variations. What can we do about that? Well, the solution, I think, is what we call cell-free or distributed massive mine. So that is building on the small cell deployment, but we are connecting all of the access points together using cloud computing so that we can actually let them cooperate and serve you wherever you are. So you will not be served by just one access point, the one with the strongest signal, but all the surrounding ones that can provide you with the strong signals. And if you do this in the way that we are describing in my recent book's foundation of user-centric self-free massive MIMO, we get this blue curve here which is not better in the best cases, but it's four times better in spectral efficiency in the worst cases. So we are really focusing on the users that will be active most of the time because they are at the edges of the cells and we are improving a lot for them. So we will actually see an improvement on the type of service quality that you can expect in the network. So I think that cell-free massive MIMO or distributed MIMO or whatever we want to call it is the first evolution of massive MIMO technology that we will see in practice because it is what we really need. But there are two more long-term flavors that people are talking about. The first one is reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. These are like RF mirrors that can reflect signals from a transmitter towards the receiver to take it around a blocking object, for example. And this is an exciting new technology it's a type of repeater that is not actually amplifying signals, but it's just reflecting them as a mirror would do. It is useful for coverage extension, particularly when you have a line of sight to the surface and from the surface to the receiver, but I still don't see these strong use cases so far. It's the cases where you can use conventional repeaters, you can use as an alternative. It will probably be built, but I don't see it as the big thing that will change everything. The other thing is the extremely large aperture arrays, or ELA. So if massive MIMO base stations are called massive because we have many antennas, they're still physically small when you put them at the top of a building, and they will still create beams towards the receiver when we are in line of sight scenarios. But if we are building an extremely large aperture array, maybe covering the entire building side here, then we will now extend the radiative near field by like kilometer. And then the receivers will be in this near field and we can focus signals, not creating focused beams, but instead strong balls of energy around the receiver. And we can use this for multiple things. We can multiplex many devices at different locations. So push how many devices we can serve by order of magnitude. And it will also be possible to send multiple layers to the users, even in line of sight scenarios, because we are creating balls of energy around the different antennas. And if we go up in frequency, we will also be able to do this more and more because we can squeeze in more antennas and extend the near field even further. I will conclude by making the point that paradigm shifts are happening in computer science. And this is something that can actually happen also in wireless. So look at high performance computing. Here I'm showing a timeline and the green line here is the clock frequency. It has been increasing exponentially for a while. In year 2000, we reached one gigahertz uh, in clock frequency. But then we saw this kind of saturation. So nowadays it's only a few gigahertz that is the sampling rate or clock frequency. And what has instead happened is that for a long time we used one processing core in our computers. And then around the year 2010, we started to use more and more cores. And now this is what really dominates the evolution of processors. To have more cores, so we can process multiple layers at the same time. And to give you an analogy when it comes to wireless, I think that we will see a saturation of this kind when it comes to going up in frequency in order to get more bandwidth, a higher sampling rate because we will not see a payoff. It's only over short distances that you can really benefit a lot from having a lot of bandwidth. Instead, in order to handle more traffic, we would like to serve many users at the same time and send many layers. And that is the analogy here of using more cores or layers. Now it's spatial layers that we are transmitting, maybe using cell-free massive MIMO or using extremely large aperture arrays where you can actually send as many 
players as you like by just adding more and more antennas into your arrays.